Hi, so this is the first of the case studies that we'll be doing for this second portion of the class. Congratulations on finishing your exam. I'm sorry that it's, you know, never exciting to take an exam, but now you're on to what I hope will be the interesting parts of the class. Each week we'll be handling a different case study, and this week we're talking about um, the Ford Pinto case, which is a famous example of, depending on how you uh, evaluate it, either a negligent design or a successful uh, corporate decision-making process that led to a successful product that happened to have some side effects that were unfortunate. And what we're seeing here is a a case study reader by Birch and Fielder. I've asked you theoretically to read a pretty large section of it, although I will encourage if you haven't completed the reading, it may be most important to look at the introductory section by Birch and Felder on the nature of ethical case studies, and then the Kelman section um, in which he does a careful analysis of the logic of cost-benefit analysis, the briefest version of the case itself, that is the details of what the Pinto car is about, um, as an ethical case study, we'll go over in the lecture. So if you uh, skim over some of that, I totally understand. One of the things that you'll be hopefully learning or practicing in the case studies is sometimes you are attempting to skim and see where attention is needed. The case study readings can be longer in some cases than others, and that may be useful as a, a skill to practice. Now, the readings themselves, in the order that they're provided in the book, give you a structure to think about the case and other cases. First of all, a framework is provided. What is the case? what is a case supposed to do, then an introduction to the case that is often a listing or a recitation of the events, the details, who the players or the actors are in it, what kind of stuff happened, where contests or disagreements are uh, known about what issues were involved, um, and then moving on from that, introduction to the case and the details of the case in the introduction. Um, this is a good example where we have key documents that record specific perspectives that include evaluation. So both the Pinto Madness article originally written in 1977, which is a key point in the story of the Pinto, and this uh, response from Ford written a few years later when the scandal just wouldn't go away. Um, this is, uh, these are the kind of documents you look for to be able to establish what the different perspectives are in a case. And that's important because one of the things we're doing in the case is not only applying our own ethical view, our own ethical framework to decide on what happened in the events, but we're trying to evaluate the perspectives of those involved, of who was in the time, what's going on. And that's particularly important because in some ethical frameworks we would apply, the intention or the decision-making matters. And so documents that reveal or show decision-making can be especially important. Now, after that is a larger discussion of where a lot of the fighting, the disagreement in the case exists, and that is about the use of the decision-making, or some would say even the ethical practice of cost-benefit analysis, and so a little later on we'll be focusing on that. But you should have gotten a broad discussion of it in Kelman. Additionally, Birch, who's one of the editors of the volume, his chapter, which links specifically the concept of product safety to the uh, the Ford Pinto case, we are, I suggest, I ask you to read it because it starts to introduce us to the language and the concepts of liability that will come up later again in the course. And we'll see 
as we move through that these concepts are fundamental. Um, I often start by pointing out that as we begin talking about a case like this, one of the things that you guys are often being exposed to for the first time, aside from some of you may not have realized just how much of a life and death decision engineering can be, but the thing that often students haven't seen before is how business logics are used in place of perhaps the you may prefer logics of engineering that you're being taught in school. And so these case studies are also preparatory for how other people's decision making patterns or techniques, ethical frameworks that you will be exposed to can be understood and in some cases like cost benefit analysis responded to. So I mentioned prior to the exam what case studies were and I talked about them a little bit, but this being the first one, we are taking a moment to look at the structure of case studies, how they work. And that's um, an, a, an explicit component in what is discussed in the introduction to the case study that we're reading for this week. Bursch and Felder take time to talk about why case studies are important. And in particular, they link back to the demand for the need for reflexivity or reflective ethical attention uh, that we've been talking about all semester. Um, and they say at the very beginning of the book that case studies such as this one um, pose particularly important and difficult questions about what is right and wrong, which we would miss or potentially answer incorrectly if we were unreflexive. And the Ford Pinto case is really an important case for a couple of reasons. One, because it's so often a reference point for when and how people have discussions of corporate liability and corporate decision making, even though the techniques of decision making are often more sophisticated today, at their core, they are still very similar to these. And so looking at a case study as they'll describe that the purpose of a case study is to be comparable to other situations. It's having yet another kind of mental model that we can refer back to so you don't walk into a new situation without any resources, without any way to see it. And so I, I tend to think of this in terms of the kind of language that they use on about the fifth page, XVII, they say it's important to keep in mind that these questions can only be posed, ethical questions about a case can only be posed because we already have an ethical vocabulary and, an, and a way to ask questions about what's going on, right? That the questions and the ability to do it allow us to propose answers and debate them in a meaningful way. And that's a particular advantage of having exposure to case studies is you have structures and abilities or um, capabilities that are built up out of exposure to those systems and that are able to do it. One of those, for example, is that having seen how decision making in one corporate or business situation has been done, it is a little reminder it's a possibility to notice or at least to ask if decision is decision making is being done that way in the future and throughout the case of the of the ford pinto we'll see that there is a tendency not to be able to look to external obligations and duties whether you're talking about laws common mores and morals of the culture, ethics, uh, as established professional ethics, religion, um, even basic norms of behavior, we're not going to find those dictating behavior because so much of the decision making is directed by these very specific business logics. And even in the case of the final element of the Pinto story, where it goes to court, um, what they find is that even in a legal battle over a criminal investigation, 
the acceptability of business decision making ends up overpowering because there's a very a, a large difficulty in perceiving those business decisions in the same way we would other ethical decisions. And throughout that, there is then also, we'll talk about the concept of risk, the concept of safety, and what is acceptable in those forms. And we'll be returning to ideas about ethics in the form of justification, obligation, um, and uh, in particular, uh, how consequentialist ethics rely on measurements. Now, any case study is actually a combination of two things. So in an ethics case, there's some elements or issues that are agreed upon um, that are related to an outside reference, right? They're not subject to interpretation in the same way. That is, which interpretation is right, which uh, action happened, which effect occurred, which moment when something happened. Some of those things, we can look to documentary evidence, to empirical evidence, to data. <clears throat> and those elements are answerable based on the systems of knowledge that we have in our society beyond or outside of personal interpretation. And so the specific questions where interpretation is limited or linked, the, that is the correctness of the answer to the question is linked to a specific form of information that makes it knowable, not deniable. Those are issues of fact, right? So for instance, the specific materials used in a design decision, right? We have a record of that. We have the actual materials, the basic elements of the story, which things happened first, where there's a record of it, who is involved. We may not know which person in a room made a decision because it's not written down, there's no record, but we can often find out who's in the room. If we know, for instance, that there is a company involved and that this person is in charge of the company, this person is in charge of the division, we can assume that it is a known issue that those people were participating in decision making. Now that gets very complicated because issues of fact can be fought over, right? The boss can say he didn't know that it is deniability is possible, but in many cases there are internal documents, things like the memos involved in the Pinto case and other cases that specifically link Right, where we don't have to worry about that deniability, the questions, because an answer can be established based on a factual participation. Now, that's very different from issues of evaluation that aren't issues of facts. Some parts of the story, some questions, we will not be able to produce an answer with an issue of fact as the answer. Right. It's not going to be possible in some cases to do that. Um, and often that comes down to uh, what happens inside of thinking or inside of decision making, as opposed to the material or structural components that are documented. And so when we're looking at those questions, there's a lot more room to recognize them as what's called theory driven or interpretive. And for an evaluation question or an interpretive question, they may relate to a fact, but they cannot be answered by the fact. So if, for instance, I argue that I can flip a coin to determine you guys' grades in a class, we can all agree that a coin is doable. We all agree that I have the ability physically to enter a grade into the grading system on the computer. We can agree on those facts. Where we would then disagree is on the moral rightness, the ethical decision making, the system of expectations, all of which may appear different to different people. So while I can say, Yes, I can, in fact, flip a coin to decide on the grade. It's not necessarily possible for us to agree on whether that's the right action or the wrong action based only on facts. 
if it's right or wrong, will be based on which theory or which evaluative structure, which ethical framework is applied. And that means that theory driven or evaluative stuff questions are dependent on mechanisms of decision outside of those answerable with facts. So in a case study, we lay out the case facts first as much as possible, right? We may have a timeline, we may have a de set of details. Um, I, at one point, uh, argued that it was often a good idea to have a what's called a dramatis personae in a play. It's the list of who's going to appear in the play. We can have all those facts as determined as much as possible ahead of time. And then once those are settled, once we've filled in those answers, then we can attempt to distinguish between and describe theory-driven and interpretive elements separately from that. Right. And both of these require research. In some cases, the interpretive elements are actually very easy to research. You'll have statements, descriptions of how people acted, what people said, in what way, uh, for instance, a person acts is or should be defined by their profession. In some cases, an engineer has promised, has accepted a set of ethics, and therefore we have uh, an argument at least, that we have a shared basis of interpretation. In other cases, the theoretically driven or the interpretive framework or the ethical framework is going to be variable and we will have to make a decision for ourselves about which one is the correct one. Now, that's not necessarily gonna be about the fact that you are universally right. But if you're clear about which one your ethical framework, which way of theoretically interpreting you're, you're using, and you use it correctly, you can't be wrong in the same way that you are wrong if you get an issue of fact wrong. Right? Somebody can say they disagree with the theory, but they can't disagree with what you say inside that theory. Similarly, when somebody else says something and they say, you can't disagree with me, this is what the theory says, it is entirely fair to disagree with the theory. You can't necessarily say that they're doing it wrong if they're performing, applying, and evaluating with that theory correctly. But you can say, according to this belief, according to this reason, according to this societal expectation, their theory or, or framework is incorrect. So in case studies, this is particularly important because often the disagreement, the issue, the conflict, the controversy comes down to theoretical differences. And one of the particularly important theoretical difference is when people disagree on what the problem in the question is. So in my silly example of a coin flip, we, you and I as student and teacher, should be able to agree on what the goals of grading are. If we disagree on that, we'd say we have a disagreement on the basis of the problem to be solved. That is, we're asking different questions. If I believe that the important thing is you're learning, not that you did the work, but that it actually demonstrates that you learned, it would lead me to one interpretation. If you believe that turning in work, whether you learn or not, is the basis of the grade, that would lead you to a different interpretation. Now, that's not that either of those is fundamentally wrong. It's that they are fundamentally asking different questions. One is what work is required. One is what learning is required. Similarly, if I use the silly example of the coin flip as a way to grade, I could ask, I want the easiest way to grade you for me, which is a simple problem solution match. You would then argue randomness is not appropriate because you want to define the problem not as the easiest way for me to grade, but the easiest way for you to get a good answer, a good grade, or a grade that actually represents your work, 
So it would need to have a different evaluation in it. So it's a silly example, but try and imagine what the different perspectives produce in terms of problems and then what solutions would match those problems. And in often in disagreements or in controversies, this question of who defines the questions being asked and which answers match them is a key issue. It's a key issue in the Pinto case. It'll be a key issue in other cases we look at. And if you consider most big controversies that you care about in the world today, it's the basis of where the conflict falls. We're not disagreeing necessarily on issues of fact. We're not disagreeing within one framework of evaluation. We're simply disagreeing on what the problem or the question to be responded to is. If you have a different question, a different problem, you come to a different answer, even if you use similar frameworks of evaluation or interpretation. So when we look at a controversy, we should always be looking for who is saying what the problem is, how they're framing the question, how they're considering it, and how that leads them to the answer. And that's a particularly difficult task to research until you have practice doing it because you often have to infer or guess with evidence what those question moments are. Now, the Pinto case is often a good case because it's very clear who was establishing which questions, which answers to those questions. And so as we move forward, we'll see that is um, it's clearer than it usually is here. Now, in looking at that, we want to be clear who the actors, the participants are, and so there are different terms. So an implicated actor is someone who makes part of or the whole of a decision. An interested group is somebody who is either acting to participate in making the decision or is affected by the, the, the decision, right? So in this Pinto case, the people who design the car are implicated actors. They're making decisions, but everybody who's on the road with those cars that may blow up is potentially an interested actor as well. Legal scholars, people working on the laws about road safety are also in interested actors. They have, a, they have an interest or a concern. Right, their standpoint has something of note to the case. The case study often centers not on facts which are potentially unknowable, unrevealed, or already agreed upon. We may just agree what happened, but still have a controversy. Those case studies are often clear because we're choosing case studies where we're not fighting over issues of fact. We're fighting over issues of interpretation. But within those cases, the focus on the disagreement between all those different peoples, implicated actors, interested actors, actor groups, those people involved, who do they connect to, right? What do they decide? How are they involved? Mapping out and determining it. We've been working on ideas like norms and like uh, divvying up responsibility into uh um, non-direct or absolute responsibility. We've talked about the idea of looking at complex choices and chained choices. We, we're trying to move to our position where the, the different groups can be evaluated together and we'll get a much richer understanding of what happened in the case. And one way to think about that is that each group or individual has a different standpoint or perspective of note. That is, we may be able to say that every person who's never been, you know, nobody who's ever been in this class um, is in one category. People who have been in this class are one category. We may find similarities between all the people who've been in this class, but they each have a slightly different standpoint. Freshmen, juniors, seniors. There are differences in perspective that we can start to 
piece together and understand. And it turns out that those will affect how people answer questions, how people ask what problems there are, and how those things are done. And it turns out, for example, that seniors who are trying to graduate have a greater interest in passing the class as opposed to an A than somebody who's a sophomore uh, potentially a first semester junior who has more time to worry about it taking it again than a final semester senior. And we describe those differences of perspective often as interests. Those interests are literally the way that the perspective des decides or defines um, what they want or need out of a situation. Um, and so we can also describe these different groups as interest groups. Graduating seniors have to get an A or they won't graduate. Different interests than people in another position. Faculty members have a different interest than students. So the case study is really often going to be about storytelling. It's going to be about evaluating which parts of the story can be told in different ways. Those are often the theoretical components, the theory-driven or interpretive components, and which parts have to be told the same way or you're lying. And those are often the issues of fact. Within a case study, we're then going to be able to apply and consider different frames of reference, different perspectives, different theories, different uh, ethical frameworks or theories to be able to see what is going on and how they would play out. For instance, in this case, we'll see that almost all groups are using different versions of consequentialist ethics, and they end up having a great deal of controversy, a great deal of disagreement, not even from having a huge difference of um, issues of fact, not from having a huge difference of perspective. We're not talking about people, you know, who are that different from each other. What we're really seeing is the effect of applying two different systems of consequentialism to determine if an action is right or wrong. So here we are, the brief summary of what can be considered a fairly complicated or a fairly simple case of the Ford Pinto. Now, the Ford Pinto was the first of what was called a, a, a subcompact or a compact car produced in the United States by an American automaker for the American market, and in particular for the suburban market that was the growing community zone around cities of the 1960s and 70s. It had, um, it had been a weird time in the U.S. Following World War II, following into the 1950s, lots of people were moving into a recently invented, really, um, idea of what the American dream housing system was that was rapidly expanding. Those suburbs, that is, uh, as you guys are probably all familiar with, areas outside of major cities that spread out to allow single family or non-connected homes, often in developments, required more driving. And because of that, often required families to have two cars. They changed and shifted in that period a lot about how we drive, where we drive, who was doing driving. And in particular, this was also happening at a time where from the early 60s into the early 70s, gas prices were going up dramatically. In the 1970s, there was the what's now called the the gas crisis or the oil crisis was a culminating event of that. But precursors to that had begun by 1966 when Lee Iacocca, who was recently put in charge of a development side at, uh, at Ford, argued that they should compete with um, the three Japanese compact, Japanese manufactured compact cars that had been increasingly popular on the American market. 
Now, Lee Iacocca had a lot of credibility and a lot of authority at Ford because he had been the designer of record, well, really the bureaucrat of record who had gotten the Ford Mustang onto the roads. And so people trusted him in a set of decisions that had a lot of effect on how the Pinto was then made. Now, the, the Ford Pinto is pitched as an idea in 1966, and right around the same time, they are aware that a whole lot of states, but also federal national transportation safety is becoming an issue. Relatively recently, people had been fighting about whether seat belts should be used, whether speed limits should be imposed. At that time, none of that was really legally mandated. A few states had their own laws. So Lee Iacocca and other executives from Ford decided to proceed with um, the the Pinto as a project. Pinto was a smaller, lighter, less ex extreme version of a horse to name the car after. And so in 1966, the Ford, the Ford design process begins for the Pinto. But I think it's actually really important that we recognize when we're talking about decisions, we're not talking about decisions in a vacuum. You can't really think of the story of the Pinto without also talking about the story of the safety regulations, which are key to the legal and ethical evaluation of the Pinto. At the same time in 1966, within a month, of the original suggestion of producing the Pinto at Ford, Ford began working um, to participate in and even potentially have a seat at what was forming as the National Transportation Safety Board. And they were arguing, um, in fact, in some cases, they were even drafting the language of the law that would be the safety law. Recognizing that they wouldn't necessarily be able to have everything their way, one of the pieces that was pushed for by Ford and other car manufacturers was, in fact, the idea that you would not be the phrase's grandfathered. So if the law passed after a car was on the road, the law would not apply in full to that car. They, therefore, were very aware as they pushed for this time limitation that said a car that had already been sold in the U.S. wouldn't be covered by some portions of the transportation safety laws. They also pushed to decrease the standards. And they also, in doing that, recognized that um, by lowering the standards at the national, the federal level, they were also producing a, uh, a, a counter pressure where some states, including California, were then choosing to have higher standards than the federal one. Now, all of this is being done in uh, Washington, D.C., in state houses of various states, but it's being done within the direct knowledge of the executives at Ford who are making other decisions. So Lee Iacocca was aware that uh, Robert McNamara, who would later be Secretary of Defense, was a close legal advisor, a uh, close policy advisor to President Kennedy. Um, and Robert McNamara had been the president of Ford. A lot of people from Ford and from other major companies moved into executive positions in policy and politics related to these issues because they could claim the authority of knowing about driving in cars. And they maintained connections so that the management of dr driving and of cars on the road continues to have an input, an impact being provided by the policy interests, the legal interests of the car companies. And among other things, one of the things that they negotiate between 1966 and 1967, as they are making the initial round of design decisions on the Pinto, is they get the legal permission to use and to rely on, to be protected from liability or, or legal responsibility at least, um, 
in the case of decision making by what's called cost benefit analysis. And so the story of the Pinto is absolutely deeply connected to this other story of the legitimation, the ongoing acceptability of cost benefit analysis. Starting in 1966, we get that story beginning for both of them. And it's one of the reasons it's such a useful case study, because the fact that Ford is having both these processes happen at the same time means that they are therefore obviously, as an issue of fact, aware of the possibility of debate. Right. If you are sending people, spending money, hiring people to be lobbyists around a specific issue, then it is inarguable. You cannot argue that they were aware that that was something that other people could disagree with. Now, in that first year, one of the things that becomes clear is that there are not only the general economic interests of getting the Pinto on the road as fast as possible, because there are already other small cars, smaller cars that are being produced by Ford that you want to compete with, but there is now this new economic or financial demand, which is that they get on the road and pass their tests, do their things as early as possible because these new laws are coming, which will make the car safer, but potentially increase costs. In 1966, towards the end of the year, as uh, the design for the Pinto is really ramping up on paper, nothing has been built yet, um, Lee Iacocca, who's in charge of the project, says, um, we will make this car. And they begin testing a variety of small car formats, largely based on the use of components from cars that are already on the market in the line of cars that Ford makes. But they realize fairly early in this process that some of the things will need to be different. And one of the things that becomes particularly important is realizing that with gas prices going up, wanting to build a small car, if you want decent performance, they need to make it light. And so relatively early in this process, before 1968, Lee Iacocca says the guiding principle of designing the Pinto is the absolute limit, $2,000 sale price, 2,000 pounds. And if we go back to the facts of the case, it turns out that there's regular reference to this, both in the state legal statements under oath, in the memos, in the documents, where people refer to this. And while the Iacocca later says that while it's a goal, it should have been conceived of by any sensible person as having been flexible, safety is important after all, but it's very clear from that point on, no one else saw it as flexible. So we have this story going on where um, he sets a commitment to boundary limit to the people doing the design, and they attempt seeing that problem definition to answer with a solution that fits it. And they do some interesting things. Sometimes they're not bad ideas, although in the end, the culmination or the accumulation of all those different ideas in aggregate turns out to have some tragic effects. 1967, they finished the basic outline of the car, which includes the chassis shape and a number of other things. They've determined to use these, a number of the components that are already produced for other cars. And that means that the initial tooling can begin on the factory. And one of the things that you may not realize is that when you talk about tooling a factory, that's literally building new production line, getting new robots, programming and structuring the factory. And it's a huge investment. So once you begin tooling, it is very unusual to change it. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about this is while different reports and different data sources will disagree, the average period of design for a car at this time was close close to four, four years before tooling began. So 
we can see disagreements. Some of the people say they have experienced plenty of cars where it's 24 months, but tooling begins before the draft design of the car for the Pinto had even gotten off paper. They were still arguing and deciding how it should work on paper, and they've already begun tooling for the car. And so what that produces is a strong pressure to maintain design decisions as soon as possible and to not go back and change anything. By 1968, the majority of the design work is done and the factory has finished tooling up. The prototypes are being tested and the initial crash, te crash tests are being done internally. They're not for public release because that doesn't actually get required. Um, immediately, but they will report that they passed those tests internally. They know that there are real questions about whether they passed the test. They also know that parallel to the federal regulations that they, they say they passed, California is in the process of passing a stricter one because cars are expected to travel between states. Once California's laws go into effect, means every car has to be designed for that standard. Ford, in that story of policy and lobbying, Ford sends people to California to try and delay the passage of the law. It continues to be this back and forth push pull as they rush to get the car out. In 1971, just less than four, just more than four years after the project begins, the first cars are sold and they begin to sell very well. They are considered a desirable, well-priced, well-designed car. 1972, there is continued, continued argument about pricing, uh, sorry, about uh, policy and about standards. California's laws begin to go into effect, affecting the pressure on the national laws. One of the things that is particularly noteworthy in 1972 is that after uh, almost two years of fighting about the details of the use of cost benefit analysis in policy, they get approval to do what's called the cost benefit analysis of catastrophic failures. Um, that is, if somebody dies, how much is that person's life to be calculated as valued? And in 1972, they settle that price at $200,000. And you can actually see in the reading or uh, on, one si on one of the slides coming up, we'll have a little chart that gives the very basic logic of that. Now, one of the things to recognize is that this was not controversial for almost two years because the people having the argument about cost-benefit analysis felt it was inappropriate to have a price on people's life. It was controversial as a component because there was a lot of disagreement on what that price should be. In the end, the $200,000 is based on a variety of other actuarial and accounting techniques used to determine evaluations um, of how much value to use in cost-benefit analysis. And in the end of the in the end of the day, that is, again, one of those important things because it, par it is part of what defines the Pinto. By 1972, the car is on the road. They've sold half a million or a ton of cars, and they've already started getting reports of people dying in the cars. 1975, there are more standards passed. Things are getting tougher out there for car manufacturers, and they actually put money aside to continue paying people rather than have a public discussion about these cars that are bursting into flames. They set money aside to cover the expected future costs of cars blowing up and killing people. Um, around that same time, part of the reason they set that money aside is we get the first public stories about these questionable car fires. 1976, new rear impact standards come into effect, largely due to the federal standards needing to match or harmonize with state standards, including California's, at which point new testing is done. And once again, while Ford insists that they pass, all the data suggests that they probably fail. 1977, 
um, the Ford Pinto Madness article that you have in this reader comes out, and this becomes not only a national scandal, but a major financial problem for uh, for Ford because their credibility and sales in the market begin to drop. 1978, attempting to head off that uh, damage their credibility and placement in the market as the dominant car seller in the country, um, they uh, they do a recall trying to regain user confidence. They recall a ton of the cars. They actually attempt for a year to resell some of those recalled cars, retrofitted. Um, they'd already, the new cars sold between 1977 and 1978 had already been retrofitted with stuff to try and minimize the danger. Um, but the car never really sells again. By 1979, they have stopped selling it. In 19, as a new car, there are still used ones being sold. And in 1980, um, there is one of the culminating points in this story, which is the not in some ways about the Pinto, but about the, the firm absolute acceptance having been completed of cost benefit analysis when the logic of cost benefit analysis challenged in criminal court where Indiana, uh, three girls, young women in a car are burned to death. It is a national tragedy when people talk about this as being a preventable accident brought about by the poor design of the Pinto. And the state um, accepts of not just lawsuits, but that they will attempt to try the Ford Motor Company for criminal uh, a criminal charge of negligent homicide. And they, uh, they actually, believe it or not, win a not guilty verdict. Ford gets a not, gu not guilty verdict. Um, they, uh, I accidentally on the timeline on the chart, I write innocent, but it's not guilty verdict by way of what is really a technicality. The car in question in the case had stopped at a light and a van that wasn't paying attention had bumped into them at about 15 or 20 miles an hour. I forget what it is. Um, and the car had exploded. And it turned out that under the law, in the way that the law was written, the accident couldn't blame Ford because their car was stopped. So they're led off on a technicality. And what this demonstrates to everybody, basically, is that the the process of decision making was legitimate and so this is um a huge scandal in some ways but it's also an incredibly important moment in business culture where the success and the permission to use cost benefit analysis is cemented in management culture in 1980 by 1981 it has uh, become a standard component of business, business and management education. And I'll point out again that it was invented in a practical sense around 1965. Less than 25 years later, it is uh, becoming the dominant way that decisions are made. So we look at the case study of the Pinto and we can actually see um, what the, uh, I will say good and bad for false neutrality, but mostly the bad of that is. So that's the, the story in a broad sense, but the specific issues are, as they're designing the car, they want to make a, a, a new arrangement or a less common arrangement of where the gas tank is to allow for greater storage space because they've used a shorter body length to preserve the weight and the size of the car. Now, since they want to make a small car, they needed to make that problem solution definitions. Smaller car, smaller length of the car, therefore they needed, if they wanted to have storage in the trunk of the car, in the back, they needed to do something about the gas. The gas, instead of being placed behind the back seats, above the axle, the gas tank is lowered below the, the floor of the trunk of the car. And you can see the image from the book there. 
Now, one of the things about this is we often talk about decisions as if one decision is on its own. We've talked about in relation to Rennix and Robinson that we need to think of decisions in a complex way where they're chained together or linked. Because, for instance, often Ford justifies or defends the idea of this relocation of the gas tank by pointing out that it works fine in other cars. If we isolate this one decision, then it's a good decision. The problem is that when we connect that to the other things, the failures of a testing standard that would allow for them to uh, really recognize where the risks were, what kind of risks were involved, how much of a risk it was, the problem of them not having to respond because they've established a cost benefit decision making technique that says that this won't cost them that much when we connect it to this other decision about using the components from other cars so the differential column the one of the pieces of the powertrain which sits between the rear tires and therefore right next to this gas tank has been taken from another car the that's another decision. The decision to begin tooling before the prototype was assembled meant that they couldn't alter the length of the car even by one inch. The fact that they make each of these decisions separately doesn't excuse them as good decisions. Each one is connected to the others. In the end, the car goes out to market with this gas tank in a lower position, and the gas tank is basically up against a differential and which has bolts sticking out which when the car impacts gets an impact from behind when it's hit from another car when it backs up into something even the the bolts punch into the gas tank causing gas to spill now there are lots of different problems with this and it turns out that even even as early as something like 1968, one of the designers had already pointed out that a one to two dollar plastic cushion, a baffle in between those two components would significantly re reduce the risks of gas tank problems. That one to two dollars is a new tooling, a new cost, and it's no longer allowable because they've decided that this is not a problem. They've already, using cost-benefit analysis, determined that these risks are acceptable from a financial point of view. They don't go ahead with that. Similarly, the lowering of the gas tank means that the, the filler hose, where you put the gas in on the side of the car, is longer than usual, and it has to be at a weird angle, so it has been made out of a flexible plastic. Because the design process is rushed, they don't do a very good job designing it, and it keeps coming loose. Because the car is designed for lightweight, which is an important design structure because they want a lighter car to be good gas mileage, they've decided not to have a strong metal barrier between the trunk of the car and the interior of the car. Many cars at the time had a, the trunk of the car was literally a metal box. This one has a thin barrier that does not block the whole space. And in fact, it turns out that there is an air gap between the bottom of the car and the space behind the seats, which means that now if you have gas fumes coming out of this punctured gas tank, those gas fumes can go directly into the car. Each decision on their own may be okay. But what ends up happening is that you've produced a series of decisions, which when connected, when they're taken in aggregate, mean that even a 10 or 15 mile an hour minor crash, which wouldn't necessarily harm anybody else, can produce a situation where your car is suddenly filled with fire. Now, I'm only talking about some of the decisions, right? One of the decisions was a stylistic decision. They wanted the car to be light and they wanted it to look a certain way. So they gave it a very thin, ineffective bumper. The frame of the car was very light. So they couldn't really have a bigger bumper without redesigning it. There are all these other decisions that lead to this point. And as they go through those decisions, when they're making the decisions, they're evaluating the probabilities of bad outcomes and calculating an estimated cost to pay for those bad outcomes. That's how cost-benefit works. 
right? You take the potential profit and the potential costs and you try and balance them out so you get greater profit. And at a basic level, that is sort of a reasonable thing to do. We'll talk later about how the problem with cost-benefit analysis isn't that you're trying to make a profit. The problem with cost-benefit analysis is the actual other stuff around that where you decide that all decision-making comes down to profit. So as we move through this story of design, of rapid production, of making those strong, absolute, unquestionable um, design uh, mandates by Lee Iacocca that says it can't be 2001 pound, right? So one of the reasons that they say that the the management team wouldn't allow the plastic baffle between the gas tank and the differential is because even though it was one pound, it would have put it over the 2000 pound limit, right? We can see a continuing story of how these pieces of the story produce certain outcomes. And then the question becomes, once we've put together the issues of fact, right, these lobbyists here, this tooling of the factory here, this car, somewhere, depending on whether you believe Ford's estimates, which are much lower, or other estimates, which place it much higher, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 people die because of this. And I know it sounds strange to say that we have, have disagreements, but one of the difficulties of relying on issues of facts is that issues are often, facts are often reported differently. So to be counted, Ford says it's only people in moving vehicles. It's only people who died in the vehicle, not in the hospital a week later. And because of the way we account and report deaths, it's really hard to get a fixed number. So for instance, when journalists tried to accumulate the number of people who died, it came out as several hundred more like four or 500. When Ford says it's this many people, it's under 100. Um, some journalists and scholars have placed it close to 1,000 people because long-term illness after burns in fire accidents can take a long time to contribute to your death. Each of those different interest groups, each of those different perspectives leads not just to a theoretical interpretation of the things that are overtly overtly theoretical, but it means that even in the case of something that seems like it should be an issue of fact, we may find disagreement because the mechanism of evaluation, the mechanisms of fact finding can be disagreed with. And hopefully you'll be able to recognize, for instance, that the theory driven, the evaluation based on Ford is motivated by different interests, and then you can evaluate those interests. Ford has a financial interest in making sure that number is low. Journalists, you might you might be biased and say that journalists are always going to try and make it a bigger scandal. But for example, scholars who have no strong uh, benefit, they have no personal interest in one or the other, tend to find large numbers also much larger than Ford's. So we can begin to get a clearer picture of the issues of fact by recognizing where theory-driven decisions are being made. At its basic mechanism, cost-benefit analysis is a form of consequentialist approach, measuring the outcomes of a decision to suggest whether the decision should be made one way or another. It applies a logic that says the outcomes are knowable and it is intended to determine the course of action in the future. It is not necessarily retrospective. Like many kinds of ethics, this is not a universal solution to evaluation. So for instance, one of the things that happens with cost benefit analysis is as time goes on, you may have new information and that would produce a different evaluation. In the case of the Ford Pinto, one of the interesting things to note 
is that during the time scale that we're talking about from 1965 to 1980, it worked. Cost benefit made a bunch of money for Ford. But if we use that same logic of if the action will produce a positive result using a measure in money, it may not have been successful in the long run. Between 1975, 78, um, they were still one of the top car companies in the nation, despite the controversial fires. Between 1977 and 1981, they significantly lost market share. And in fact, one of the things that happens there is that the weakness of their market share produces an opportunity that they could not have predicted for the increased importation of foreign manufactured cars. The number of foreign manufactured cars goes up for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it goes up is because Ford's dominance of the industry goes down. As public confidence in the company goes down, the purchasing of their cars and the choice by users of automobiles to choose other cars goes up. And there's actually really good data to show that in the long run, a number of choices, centrally, the decision to produce an unsafe car in the Ford Pinto produced a net loss to the company over the decade following that. Between 1980 and 1990, the company lost a significant portion of market share. And as somebody mentioned in class, one of the sections, one of the things that happens is that between 1980 and now, Ford has to redevelop what their goal is, what their problem and business model is, and they shift a significant part of their focus to selling cars overseas, purchasing other car companies because they are able to make uh, inroads there where the Ford Pinto scandal hadn't soured public impressions of the company. And at the same time, they changed the focus of their business model to increasingly promote their truck and uh, working vehicle uh, divisions um, in a way that they'd never done before. And they begin to promote and translate uh, a huge amount of their effort into trying to get people to buy pickup trucks, which had a lot of public confidence in them still because the working uh, vehicle divisions had been separate. And in fact, we can pause for a second in accepting cost benefit analysis and say, one of the things you should recognize about that is that nowhere in there is anybody accounting for the environmental costs and the potential impacts on climate change of them having promoted their most polluting vehicles as their prime business model for almost 30 years because they had failed to move into the small urban and suburban compact car market. Now, there were some successes later on. Um, Ford produces a popular, a number of popular small cars uh, decades later, but even those tend not to sell as well as some alternatives by other manufacturers. So one of the things we can look at is that cost benefit analysis isn't necessarily as successful in retrospective view with more information from a future point as it is if it's used at one point in a f deciding a future case. And one of the reasons for that is that the simplification that's done in cost benefit analysis requires significant amounts of information. If you're going to be able to evaluate all the risks, all the costs, all the potential benefits, you need a lot of information. And this is where we come to one of the central or fundamental aspects of consequentialism, which is that it's always marked by what's called the problem of measurement. Consequentialism, unlike a deontological approach, is always dependent on very specific usage of measures. You have to know what the consequences will be, or may be, or can be, or if it's a 
a reverse or a, a, a retrospective view what they were. But because we're much more concerned in ethics, in decision making with a decision moving forward, the ability of retrospective view of the hindsight is 2020 is the idiom, right? You know what happened much more easily than you can know what will happen in the future. So consequentialism has this fundamental challenge, and it's one of the reasons why many um, many people consider it uh, a, a more difficult thing. Now, I've said one of the ways to handle that is where you think something is important, determine a specific commitment, as we talked about with the design process and the uh, attention to commitments of alternative design. Because once you have a commitment, once you have a stable boundary, it directs attention it allows for a much more uh, narrow view, at least to some degree, a much more corrected view, so you don't potentially need to know everything. But it does leave you with a number of questions, right? If the consequentialist approach needs to determine future effects or consequences, what is the right way to measure that? And every different theory of consequentialism, whether we're talking about a utilitarian measure or a uh, preference-based measure, or a um, you know uh, a complicated measure like, for instance, the ones we use in drug evaluation, where we measure the specific bodily effects of the drug in large populations that takes so long around something like a vaccine or a, an even even more in some ways more complicated and over-the-counter drug. Um, those measures are not simply measuring the effect today. We're using theoretical devices. We're using conceptual frameworks to be able to say with confidence that those will continue to be true in the future. And one of the difficulties with that is if we're going to be honest about our evaluations, if we're going to be honest about our information, one of the places where those structural ethics, for example, transparency comes up is if you don't know what measure is being used, how can you possibly trust a consequentialist approach? If I just say, don't worry, in the long run, you're better off this way, how do you know what you're better off means? Right? The appropriateness, the appropriateness of a measure is determined not only by the acceptability to different people, but also by the reasonableness in terms of other ethics and values. So one of the classic concerns about cost-benefit analysis in this case is we might accept that businesses do decision-making in their business that is based on money. That's totally acceptability. But the test of reasonableness is whether in another angle, from a different take, in a different way, it would always be reasonable. So, for instance, we may say that businesses making business decisions are acceptable up to a certain point, but beyond that, right, if it comes to the question of, well, maybe they shouldn't kill a lot of people, or maybe um, even if they'll make a lot of money, they shouldn't destroy the economy for other people, or maybe they shouldn't lie, um, whatever those limits are where you say it's reasonable up to this point. Reasonableness is an interesting test because it's, it's a holistic test. We don't necessarily have to explain why something is unreasonable. And it, it derives from a tradition in ethics that dates back to the rationalists like Kant, who was in your reading on ethics, who say there is an expectation that a sane, sensible, rational person will share a basic set of reasoning. So for instance, Kant will point out that in fact, life and death decisions are different from decisions that don't have those kinds of consequences. And in fact, often that um, what he would describe as a basic um, tenet of reason or a uh, an innate capacity from the reason, reasoning mind um, will become the basis of reasonableness, right? You can, in fact, say it is obvious to people that killing people is not the same. You may even not go as far as say it's good or bad, but killing people is not the same as laughing at them. 
right? Those are different kinds of things. And so often with reasonableness as a test, um, we'll be able to recognize the difference between, for instance, the specific decision making that leads to something where you know that the outcomes will be positive or negative, that may be reasonable, but where we pause is when we go, is this the kind of decision making we'll use if we know life and death decisions are involved? And one of the points of this class is that fundamentally, engineers often forget this aspect. Technology development is often seen through the lens of narrow decisions, simple complexity, isolated decisions as not being life and death, not being large consequence, not being big effects. People forget about unintended consequences. And that means that one of the difficulties that we have when it comes to technologies is the failure of the test of reasonableness. Because if we have a lot of faith in technology and we're localizing or isolating our vision down to a single decision, it is often difficult to see where and how consequences or situations may be different. And that leads to a fundamental problem in case studies, which is we talked a little at the beginning. I spoke a little about the nature of issues of fact being different from the idea of a theoretical or an interpretive element. And one of the elements there is the idea of knowability, right? If something can be known, not guessed, not talked about, but known. And in this case, knowledge means verified, reliable belief, right? And that outside verification is a question because if in some cases we will disagree on what would be a verifiable and reliable belief. And in some parts of epistemology, the study of knowledge, we would actually call it a justified true belief. And truth is the condition of having been verified or justified by a certain reliable thing. And so knowability is a big issue for all forms of consequentialism, right? How knowable is the future? How predictable is it? And in that sense, any system of consequentialism that tries to evaluate risks comes up against an unsolvable problem of which of the risks, which of the effects are knowable and which of them are unknown. And one of the classic examples of this is if you walk into a room, you know, walking in, that, you know, you're going to walk into the room, you don't want to bump into furniture. If it's dark in the room, you might look for a light switch. But you can imagine, you can predict some aspects of the experience of walking into the room. If it turned out the room was entirely full of, you know, something, uh, snakes, spiders, something that you normally wouldn't find a room full of, the fact that you were not able to predict it doesn't make it unknowable, right? In fact, if we go back in time and say, well, you're looking into a dark room, maybe you want to go get a flashlight before you walk into it. You can choose to make something knowable by altering the research process, by altering the way you're asking the questions. And so one of the central ethical commitments true to all forms of consequentialism is a commitment to trying to develop and grow knowability. That is, you have to, and this is, you know, this is just a fundamental aspect of consequentialism. You have to commit to working on measuring correctly. So the issue of knowable versus unknown risks is particularly important in the same way that when we talked about choices, I said, often we will pay attention to some choices. We don't pay attention to others. And that effectively means that we're making choices, which we've never thought about. But because if you act, you are in fact making that choice, even though you thought you were making a different choice, much in the same way, if we're making decisions based on a consequentialist approach without appropriate measures, attention, deliberation, and potentially delay, 
then we probably are leaving questions that we need to know the answers to till later. And this is, again, not why we shouldn't use consequentialism. It's why we should try to do it well. I said the very first week in the lecture that one of the fundamental aspects of most forms of ethics is you cannot be ethical by accident, right? That doing it intentionally not only makes it more likely that you do it well, but that stumbling along in and of itself fails to attempt ethics means you're not being in intentional enough, you're not being reflexive enough to be properly applying the ethics that you have. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that in the section where Kelman um, does the ethical critique of cost-benefit analysis, he goes into a lot of detail on this, talking about how it comes out of a tradition of economic and economic economistic thought where among other things lots of things are pushed out of the measurements lots of things are made less important um, and sometimes we'll call those affordances versus externalities things you want to pay attention to that make certain pathways more likely or affordances um, some things are less likely or less paid attention to. There are things you've determined or accidentally left out. Those are externalities. Um, and the nature of um, ethical decision making should make those decisions, whether you're leaving something out or whether you're following a path of least resistance through affordances, those should be intentional choices most of the time, even in consequentialist approaches where the process matters less than the outcome. If you're going to say that we're before you're making the decision, you're going to be doing the analysis, you're going to be making the decision. You still need to be attempting to do it right, or you're going to miss things that can change the outcome. And Kelman identifies three central sort of presumed or assumed aspects of cost-benefit analysis that I, I think one needs to have intentionally chosen. And you need to have a justification, a reason for them. Otherwise, you're just sort of following along and it's not ethical, it's just a decision making, right? And it's it may in some cases be fine to say that this is just the way you're making a decision, it is not ethical, but most of the time, it's probably unethical to do that. And I don't mean that in the sense of it's automatically that the actions will be wrong. But if we talk about the actions are either the right action or the wrong action, choosing to make a decision using a decision-making technique that you do not know or consider ethical. You don't know that it will be leading you to right actions is often simply in and of itself an unethical action, right? Shooting a gun wildly out the window, whether you know somebody's out there or not, is probably unethical, right? You'd want to have thought about it first. And it doesn't, doesn't make it more or less ethical if the outcomes are positive or negative. You've just done something that's horribly dangerous. And in fact, even in consequentialist approaches concerned with the outcome, the theory will still tell you that doing something where the predictable outcome, the knowable outcome, is likely to be very bad, it doesn't matter if it's right in the end that it's bad, or if it turns out by accident you've done something good, you've still acted in a wrong way. So it gets complicated with consequentialist ethics in the same way that the complex interplay, right, in deontological ethics, in those rules of action-based ethics, where you pile up duties and rules and you try and negotiate what the right, is, right action is, in amongst all of these different demands on you. And as deontological ethics, you have to know enough about the context, about the situation, to know which rules, which obligations, which demands apply. So too in this, you have to negotiate these things very carefully. So Kelman says one of the challenges, one of the problems, one of the things that he will argue makes most, if not all, cost-benefit analysis 
um, somewhat unethical is that it asks you to accept a certain set of axioms or presuppositions without actually testing whether the outcomes are going to be beneficial. And it does that by using a very specific starting point. It says we already we don't need to do the rest of that stuff. We don't need to worry about it because the action is right. If the financial benefit is there, right, if if the financial benefit I mean, it says, in fact, uh, if the benefit is there and beats out the cost. But the next axiom will, in fact, say we can measure everything using money. And this is a, a challenging thing to disagree with because it's one of those theories where it is self-consistent. So I said at the beginning, one of the weird things about theory is um, you can argue with somebody that they're using the wrong theory or you can argue with them that they're applying it wrong. They're doing their own analysis wrong to lead them to a bad result. But but those are two very different things, right? So if I argue that Ford made a bad decision with the Pinto because in the long run, they were going, they should have been able to predict that they were going to lose market share and lose money over time. That's a very different argument than saying they probably shouldn't have done this in the first place, because even in the short term, accepting that you can put a cost value on people's lives is wrong. And so those fights happen at two different places. Right. Kelman is not arguing right now that we should um, argue within cost benefit analysis. His argument is the basic assumptions you accept to apply this theory is that um, these are not great assumptions, right? The assumption that any action is right if the benefits outweigh the costs, right? That gives you permission to do anything where the benefits outweigh the costs, even if the benefits outweigh the costs by a dollar and the costs are people's lives. Right. That may not be an assumption you want to take. Similarly, this question of the common scale or the common measure, the standardization of measure and scale of variables translated into the form of money. I think this is one of those times where we have to go back to the question of reasonableness. It may be that material damages or other things, inconveniences, it may be acceptable. But you should be able to pause and go, as they talk about in the, the Pinto Madness article in other places in this in these readings, right? We should just stop, right? The moment you say we're going to apply a cost to a life, not after the fact, right? Because there's a real difference, as we've talked about before, between what we're talking about in ethics of determining the rightness of an action leading up to that action versus the question of blame or a separate question of what the right action to repair, respond to, revenge. Those all are different actions than we're talking about. What we're talking about is if you haven't done an action and you're choosing whether or not it's a right action to do, should you be putting a price on a human life? And should you be putting a standardized price? Because in order for this theory to work, remember, everything has to be standardized, right? That would suggest that, in fact, we can use a standard format. Your mother, your sister, your father, your uncle, your best friend, and you all have to be priced using the same formula. You have to be using the same formula to price your life that you do your worst enemy, Somebody you dislike, somebody who's harming the word, a serial killer, because we don't get to make evaluations at the moral level of the worth of a person unless we have a separate body of theory to do that. And let me tell you, cost benefit analysis doesn't do that. Cost benefit analysis, in fact, is so self-consistent that if you look at the standards, the forms of the uh, um the forms in that little chart of things that helped define what it is, you'll find that, in fact, most of what is involved in deciding the price of a life are other financial values, how much the person would earn, 
how much hospital bills they would be expected to pay, what a legal and court cost for somebody to claim that that money would be, right? That doesn't take into account any of the other stuff. It doesn't take into account any sort of abstract value the person would have. And if you want to ignore that abstract value, it still standardizes from one person's life to another person's life in a way that is likely to be oversimplification. But as Kelman points out, according to cost-benefit analysis, you have to have accepted the standardization, the simplification, before you even begin to do the analysis. And that means accepting it across situations, across contexts. And I hope at this point in the semester, you've all gotten the message that, in fact, very rarely do we want to be able to use one of these concepts, one of these mental models or theories, if it doesn't say context matters. Because context is central to defining the effects and, and forms of almost everything. Now, the third thing that I think is fantastic about this and is very apropos of the Pinto case, very, very obvious, is that Ford spends more money to promote and expand the use of the legitimacy of the law's allowance for cost-benefit analysis than it probably would have spent to be able to just make the cars safe. And the reason that that's a value is that this third presumption, this third basic assumption in cost-benefit analysis is that working hard to improve cost-benefit analysis, to make cost-benefit analysis more popular, more possible um, by producing more data, more systems to use it, more places to use it, more situations you're allowed to use it and more laws to promote it, makes it more likely that cost-benefit analysis works because it protects the capacity to simplify. Right? If you can use it everywhere, then that means it's easier to use. Now, later he actually sort of suggests there's a fourth axiom, right? That because as we look at things, some things are knowable or not knowable, visible, not measurable, measurable, we'll actually end up with a secondary effect of cost benefit analysis that is, you know, as things are measured in monetary terms, Right, That means that when you put a price on something, it makes it real to it. And when other people say this can't have a price, it actually makes it harder to talk about the failings of cost-benefit analysis because cost-benefit analysis says everything has a price. Right, Because actions are right or wrong only in terms of money, anything you cannot talk about in price is made less visible. Cost-benefit analysis has become the dominant way of making decisions in the last you know, um, 60 or so years. Um, and in fact, as a specific theory of decision making, it's a little younger than that. But we'll find that it comes out of a tradition of saying that legal and policy and business institutions um, can be able to ignore ethics and other complexities in favor of and responding to money as a whole. And we'll keep coming back to that. We'll see that when we talk about liability. We'll see that when we talk about um, business ethics next week and uh, hopefully um, it'll you know, continue to build up as an idea that we do need to always make sure that we're applying these ideas correctly. And it's, it's always going to be a question of finding the right limits, because if you apply something like a simplified cost benefit analysis in lots of places, if you accept its axiom that expanding it means you're more likely to do it well, you're also saying the things you don't want to measure in money shouldn't be measured. So as we've been talking about this, we are talking about a couple of different things. We're talking about cost benefit analysis, and we're returning to and applying the idea of chained and linked actions or decisions or um, complex choice.
we're thinking about conflicting demands and design criteria, which has appeared in previous lectures, which we've talked about, that when we, when we look at these complex decision making, um, we're really trying to see how cost benefit analysis is at least to some degree, the opposite of the way that professional ethics for engineers has taught us, will try to teach us, says we should be making decisions. Cost benefit analysis, by contrast, wants to reduce complexity, produce simple answers, accelerate decision making, even as it um, may or may not produce universally beneficial results. But one of the real challenges here is that we're also bumping up against this qu these questions of probability and assessment of the future. And it's, it's worth returning to and clarifying a couple of key ideas here. One of those is the idea of what constitutes, what makes up something being safe. Right, so safety, which can be defined as uh, anything where the, the risks, the harms, the negative stuff is limited and comprehensible as appropriate, right? And I don't really think that makes sense to most people, but here's the way it works. Safety is the state in which the potential bad stuff seems right to you for that specific situation, right? So the kind of thing going on is different in different situations. When you say something is safe, it's always safe for that thing. If you're laying at home in bed, that's pretty safe. You don't expect a, you know, a meteor to land. You don't expect your house to burn down. You might be aware that those risks are possible, but the risks are limited enough and you can understand them enough that you're not worrying about them terribly. By contrast, a high risk situation can still seem safe if the risks are appropriate. So if you're driving a sports car on a track wearing a fireproof suit, in a race, you're wearing a helmet, you know that everybody else out there is a good driver. Driving 150 miles an hour is incredibly risky, but you're doing everything to make those risks limited and comprehensible as appropriate for that specific context. And, and that really isn't that really isn't that hard to appreciate, to understand when you start thinking about how you use the concept of safety, right? Most of the time when you're talking about safety, it's when you realize that a risk is inappropriate. So when we're talking about safety, what we're really doing is talking about the probability of bad outcomes in that kind of situation. And those kinds of threats, harms, bad outcomes, um, there are right kinds and wrong kinds, right? So you can expect that a house you live in may be flammable, right? You can understand that it would be potentially possible that it burns down. But if you found out that the wall boards you bought, um, which are made with a little bit of gypsum, had been you know, the gypsum material in the had had radioactive material in it, and now your house is radioactive. That's not the right kind of risk. And so the the sort of joking, I mean, it's not funny in this day and age of mass shootings, but the the way that we should think about this is a trained soldier on a battlefield with a gun is safe. A school teacher with a gun probably not safe, right? There are too many other variables. There are too many other people. There are too many people. There are too few circumstances where the gun adds to the safety as opposed to takes away from it. It's just not an appropriate context. So we don't necessarily want to think of safety as an absolute thing. And that's, again, a challenge for consequentialist ethics, because if we're using the idea of potential or possible outcomes, then different people can disagree on what outcomes are acceptable or appropriate. 
And so the entire idea of safety becomes a little bit of a challenge there. In general, when we're talking about consequentialist approaches, we're not going to talk about safety. We'll talk directly about risks. And risk is the ratio that's formed between desirable outcomes and undesirable outcomes. Something has risk or is risky when the possibility of undesirable outcomes or harmful outcomes is too high. Now, for instance, that ratio may be a thousand to one, right? If you go to the dentist for a cleaning, there is a one in a million chance that you'll die and that may be acceptable. If you go to the dentist for a tooth cleaning and there's a thousand to one chance that you die, that's probably not a risk you want to take. Different risks are produced and understood as a ratio. And when we talk about risks, one of the things I want to remind you of is risks are measurable and understandable, but they don't in fact tell you what will happen. So in any consequentialist form, you will need a response to risk. Now, the simplest form of response to that is what's called a precautionary approach or the precautionary principle. It says, if a risk is present, make sure you know what it is. And if you don't know what the risks are, don't go ahead. Stop. Prevent the action. Prevent the risks reality. Look into it. Find out what the risk is. And then you can decide on whether or not to act. And we often... Um, there are a number of names for it, but I also often we often contrast or compare precautionary approaches with risk positive approaches, right? These are the people who say, um, "Hey, you know, you never know until you try," or "Nothing ventured, nothing gained," or "Risk reward," right? So we we have ways, we have mental models of dealing with this, but. Whether you're thinking about it as a precautionary approach or a high risk, risk positive approach, we're still going to want to have an explanation, a warrant, a justification for that in our ethical system. And one of the simplest tools for that is to go back to the previously mentioned old fashioned test of reversibility. Right now, this we saw in the reading from Kant, but it actually is the basis of the golden rule to unto others. Right. So if a risk would be acceptable. If other people aimed it at you. Then that may be more likely. Right. So, for instance, in the case of the Pinto, none of the executives, probably none of the engineers were ever likely to drive uh, the cheapest bottom of the end um, compact suburban car that the Pinto was aimed at being. So they would never have to consider whether those risks were appropriate to them. If they looked at those risks and said, would I want these risks? Would these be acceptable for me if I was taking my kids to school? They might have made a different decision. So the test of reversibility, which has a lot of failings in complex situations, can be a good basic approach to risk assessment. Um, and we also want to be aware that there is a strong pressure. The market model, which we talked about in terms of uh, being connected to the hegemonic uh, system of design, which says those risks aren't ours to be determined, those risks are just throw them out in the market, has some real failings to it because you are um, disallowing your own ethical choices by doing that. And it is a form of decision making which simply puts off the decision or tries to shift it to somebody else. Okay, so we are reaching the point where I, uh, I'll let you go. But before I wrap up, I wanted us to do an exercise. We generally do this in the discussion section as a way of shaping our discussion. I'm sorry that you're doing it in isolation on your own as online students, but um, 
please do consider talking to your friends, finding somebody to talk to, whether it's somebody in the class, somebody in another section of engineering ethics, or just people that you'd enjoy talking to. Because it is one of those exercises where being able to bounce off other people, being in communication, often can direct you to see where the the blind spots are in your thinking. And we, we often want to think of... Uh, that test of reasonableness as something that can benefit from discussion. So uh, the assignment is pretty straightforward. We're literally saying you're trying to consider whichever system of ethics you're applying, but particularly for consequentialist ethics and even more so for something like uh, cost benefit analysis, that the, the way to potentially consider limiting it or affecting what outcomes will happen will be through something similar to the commitments that we said we might use in our design and engineering or professional practices when we talked about the news article right so it's we're not talking about commitments in design now we're talking about a, a slightly different level or or type of self-directed or um, ethical commitment and that's drawing a specific attention to what wouldn't be acceptable. And in some cases, this is actually a pretty straightforward process. In other cases, it can be much more complicated, right? So actually taking the time to think about what is, um, what can be called an ethical limit or a, an ethical boundary, what is something, a line that should not be crossed? And one of the reasons we talk about this is because it's actually not something you necessarily have to be able to justify a lot. Um, in the case of ethical boundaries, they can be one of those places where, for example, a deontological ethics, something you believe because of a foundational belief, doesn't have to be set aside in favor of a consequentialist ethic. At the same time, having those limits, having those boundaries, doesn't mean you can't cross them in a specific context if you evaluate it as necessary. It means you have to notice you're doing it, right? It's, it's not, ethical limits are not absolute walls. So take a minute and try and do this exercise, right? Because in response to the Pinto case, a lot of people respond to it and say, wow, I can't believe anybody would think it was okay to say the cost of a human's life is just worth this much money and it's okay to kill people as long as we come out ahead financially. So the exercise is usually to say, consider what ethical boundaries apply to decision-making in different forms of decisions. Right, Because one of the things that happens in this case study is that the engineers are thinking about things in one way, business make, businessmen, uh, their, their bosses are thinking about it in a different way, and customers, people buying cars, are thinking about them in a different way. Try and think about what kinds of different assumptions and systems of decision making those different groups are using. Right, So try and imagine four different decision-making situations or arenas. And um, you can think of them as specific decisions or a general type. And in each of those decision-making situations, pick two different, you can do more than two, but two different groups, right? Preferably groups where you can recognize that they have different interests or demands on them. And how would they look at that decision? In what way would they be trying to determine problems and questions differently? Would they be applying different systems of ethics, right? Where and how will they share limits or not share limits? And if there's something like the test of reversibility, which they share, do you really think they're actually applying it the same way? Because for instance, if a businessman says, well, everybody else is already doing it this way, so I can justify putting a price on human life because everybody else is doing that, they may see that as reversible. But the average person on the street 
would actually see reversibility differently. Reversibility would say, so your life is worth $200,000, right? I could kill you, but then I'd have to give your family $200,000. That's all your life is worth, right? Literally, how those perspectives would be applied in different contexts based on what they're paying attention to. Consider what you personally would consider unacceptable or inappropriate actions and ways of making decisions, right? Those would those things that just would automatically be outside that ethical boundary. And then try and work back from those differences to think about what a statement of those limits should be. Right? It doesn't need to be universal. It could just be in this specific thing, right? When designing a car, the car should not blow up in flames is probably not a good one. You want to be a little more specific than that in the ethical rule, a little less specific than that in the, the situation described. But give it a try, right? Um, the same rule doesn't have to apply to everybody in every situation. But working through that, the spending time thinking about what those limits are, right? If you were at work, whatever you're going to do, and your boss says, do this thing, and you realize it would hurt people, is that a limit? How much harm is the limit? Is the limit affected if you would lose your job or not? How important that limit is, is something you need to know. Okay, we'll just wrap up here. I just want to do my usual little framing of next week. I'm sorry I didn't dig out pictures from the blackboard last year. Um, the reading next week are sections from Katz's textbook. And for those of you who actually listen to this slide, I'll give you a tip. Um, while we will be talking about the other chapters, and I do think it's important to read, um, the the focus is really centrally going to be on the a uh, chapter by Black called the IBM and the Holocaust. And we'll be discussing um, explicitly how the same sort of business logics, even before it was officially um, cost-benefit analysis, participated in helping IBM be able to sell um, computers to the German government during a period which we would often almost invariably say their actions were um, bad. And so IBM was choosing to do something knowing that their actions enabled or assisted somebody else in doing something bad. And what we're going to do is move from this week, having talked about a uh, particular consequentialist approach, we'll look at how IBM applies a specific deontological approach in some ways, um, whether they really believe it or not, or whether it's an excuse to be able to make money is a separate question, but we'll be able to look at that next week. And I, I always get this moment where people look at this uh, set of readings next week and the period described is almost 80 years ago. World War II is long past. It's no longer sort of relevant. We're like all case studies. We're looking at it as an example that'll be an analogy or a comparison to contemporary situations. And believe it or not, the debate around IBM's participation is incredibly um, contemporary in how it how it works. And we can look at things like Facebook's role in all sorts of bad actions. We can look at the way that Uber participates in politics or the way that Walmart does things or the way that Amazon does things. Any of these large companies very much use a similar logic in decision making. Um, and in many cases, very explicitly, the kind of action that we'll be reading about in the case of IBM. Right, providing a technological enablement, an infrastructure that's used by people um, to do stuff that's bad. So uh, take this ser seriously. Um, every so often, I have a student who has a family history connected to um, Nazi genocide, and it can be a very emotional week. That's slightly less of an issue because you'll be able to read the 
the readings at your own pace, um, and hopefully you'll be able to find a uh, comfortable way to do that and work through it. But this can constitute my caution that you should be careful in how you approach the material, um, as opposed to when people are occasionally jumped into the classroom and how other people talk about it can affect it. Um, I wish you all a good weekend. I'm sorry about the late, uh, any, any delays in getting you work. Thank you very much.